and welcome to the Feeling Good Podcast, where you can learn powerful techniques to change the way you feel. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski, and joining me here in the Murrieta studio is Dr. David Burns. Dr. David Burns is a pioneer in the development of cognitive behavioral therapy and the creator of the new teen therapy. He is the author of Feeling Good, which has sold over 5 million copies in the United States and has been translated into over 30 languages. David is currently an emeritus adjunct professor of clinical psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine. Okay. Hello, Rhonda. Hello, David. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Great. And welcome, everyone, to episode 154. We're doing another Ask David episode, but this time we're focusing on five secrets and relationship questions. Is there anything you want to say before we begin? No, we're going to talk all about love and how to get it and how to give it and <laughs> errors that we make and how screwed up our our love relationships, our relationships with other other people c can be. And, uh, and how wonderful they can be. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so let's read the first one. Here is This one is from Kate. Kate asks, I love listening to your podcasts and I am currently reading my way through your book, Feeling Good. I appreciate that you have written and spoken about relationship problems at length. But in what I have read and heard so far, I do not see how this can apply to the current climate of casual dating and hookup culture, which is fueled by apps such as Tinder. I don't know how it's possible to build relationships when the dominant mentality is that people are disposable. It feels like no matter how much I find truth in what my date says, stroke them, give them positive affirmations, that is, and empathize with them, then they disappear or ghost at the drop of a hat. I think this may be a significant problem for many of your listeners, and I would appreciate, greatly appreciate your thoughts, as well as any practical steps on how to date in today's world. That's great. Uh, being an, an, an elderly guy, but I'm still expert in dating, I think. <laughs> so hopefully we can answer your fa fabulous question, yeah, which a is question. the most common question in all of dating. But, but what is Tinder? Can you help me with that? Yeah, Tinder is an app that people go to when they want to have a casual hookup. You mean sex without yeah. uh, love? Correct. So Sex without commitment. Maybe. I see. So this woman is looking for love at the Tinder site. That doesn't sound like good. Well, judgment. that may, I mean, maybe you could find a relationship on Tinder. But I think she's saying, it, how do you, how do you develop a relationship if you're, if the whole culture is fueled by, you know, the idea of Tinder, where you're just and you and you look at pictures and you swipe in one direction to ignore someone and you swipe in another direction. Yeah. If well, I have no objection to, to Tinder, but if you're looking to develop a meaningful uh, relationship, that's probably so, not the best place to start. The, 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 there, I have two books on relationships, and, and if you read the wrong book, you'll get, you'll get confused. <laughs> the, I have a, a book on dating, and it's really how to win the dating game, because there's a lot of power politics and things involved in, in dating. It's not all empathy and five secrets of effective communication, being deep and, and so forth, because you, you have to get people to chase you. And that's my book, Intimate Connections, which is all about how to get people of the opposite sex. Or same sex if you're gay or lesbian. Or Yeah, or same sex if you're gay or lesbian chasing after you in unlimited numbers. And it'll show you how to do that. And 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 then once you you get people chasing you and you find someone that you like, then you can deepen the relationship with the techniques in feeling good together using the five the five secrets of effective communication. But one of the uh, the the tools or the concepts in, uh, in in intimate connections is what I call the Burns rule that people only want what they can't get and they never want what they can get. And this explains pretty much everything that happens in the dating realm, as well as in, in business and, and in life, life in general. And, and so when someone is ghosting you or, or not, not, not pursuing you, you, you drop them and, and go off in, in the opposite direction, uh, chasing after people who are not expressing an interest in you is just a hundred percent way of creating creating misery for yourself. Uh, you, you had asked about, well, let, let's hear your thoughts. Let's get the... Uh, yeah, I have a client who, she, she dates a lot of people online, and she gets kind of um, 
compulsive about checking her emails and if she, or checking her text. And if she doesn't get a text from someone that she had a dinner dinner with, she gets um, you know really depressed and really anxious, and she can't function because she was waiting for that next test text. And I've told her about the Burns rule, and hope and and we're still working on it. Okay, yeah. <laughs> what the, works so far? <laughs> the the first part of the book Intimate Connections is overcoming the fear of being alone. And I yeah. used to tell both male and female patients, say, yes, I can turn your love life from rags to riches. But I won't do that until you no longer need to date. Right. Until yep. you've found happiness within yourself. Yes. And so there's a lot of tools in the first part of the book to, to help you overcome the, lo the love addiction, which is the idea is I, I can't feel happy and fulfilled and, 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 unless I'm loved. And if you have that belief, then you're going to be chasing the other person who has something that you think you need, and that will force them to, to reject you once you discover that you don't need a love relationship to feel perfectly happy and fulfilled, then it becomes far easier to develop to develop and, loving relationships. And you become a more attract you you be, people are more attracted to you. Yeah, because yeah. you don't need them, and because you can you know express an interest in them, but but they can't have the power over you of of, of rejecting you. Yeah, and you're happy who you are. Yeah, and other people are attracted to your happiness. Yeah, uh, self-esteem is is one of the greatest sources of of sex appeal. Absolutely, I've had people who came to me who were incredibly attractive, men and women. I mean, literally models for for mag, you know, like Cosmopolitan magazine and and things like that. Men and women who were very unhappy and having trouble developing loving relationships. And I've had other people who, who were, to be polite, not at all attractive. Uh, I had a guy, I shouldn't say this, but he looked like a frog. <laughs> but but he, re he really accepted himself and, and, and thought, yeah. he was, thought he was awesome. And women were just like crazy about him, chasing him, him right and left. You know, he never thought for a second that women wouldn't wouldn't think he was awesome. But there are just so many things that go into it. Have I talked about uh, 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 Kamiko Finkelstein? <laughs> Did I talk to her about her? I don't think so. Uh, the, the one of the thing I had trouble with with men who were were single is they're they're kind of rigid. Oh. And uh, and often they dressed really crappy. Oh. And. I would tell them, you know, you got to change the way you'd look. They say, no, I, I want a woman who will love me the way I am. And, and I would say, why should a woman love you the way you are? You, you look like crap. You know? <laughs> and, and I said, if you want me to help you with your love life, you've got to go to uh, Kamiko uh, Finkelstein. <laughs> she, she was this woman that worked at the men's department of the King of Prussia Bloomingdale's oh, outside of in Philadelphia. Philadelphia? And she was a genius. I mean, you know how some men, like, they look like ultra studs? <laughs> I guess, yeah. Like, their clothing is just, like, mind-boggling. Mm -hmm. Everything matches. The underpants match the socks. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, everything is just, like, super studly. Yeah. And, 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 and that, 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 that's a, a power thing there. And so I said, you've got to go to Finkel uh, Kaneko <laughs> and, and tell her that Dr. Burns referred you for a sex uniform. <laughs> and then she, you have to buy everything, whatever she, however Says. she dresses you, you can't question Accepted. anything. Yeah. And then, but she'll make you look like a, like, look like a doll. And it yeah. really, really helped. And I, I gave women this message too, but they were much easier to work yeah. with because women love fabric and color. I love that stuff too. Yeah. And, uh, and then you've got to be willing to, you know, flirt with people and not, not take them seriously. And you, you like stroking. Well, you can compliment a man as long as you don't mean it. <laughs> <laughs> then it works really well. But if you give a sincere compliment, you look real needy. Oh, that sounds so, so manipulative. It is. Yeah, I used to teach women how to manipulate men, and uh -huh. it was one of my favorite things. Uh -huh. I taught my daughter, too, when she yeah, was in yeah, high school. Yeah, yeah, you mentioned that before. It was just a, just a joy. But there is a kind of ma manipulation, and you've, you've got to be willing to learn the, the dating game and, yeah. and, and, and play it. And, and then, 
you know, it's, it's like if you won't play the dating game, it's, it's like if a bird, you know, how they mate, they dance, and prance around, and if they refuse to do that, they don't get... They don't mate. They don't mate. So, <laughs> Let's just say it that way. So that, that's what the book Intimate Connections is all oh. about. And it's a little outdated, but the basic principles are still still the same. Angela Crum said oh, one really of these good. years she's going to help me revise it and oh, that's modernize awesome. it. Yeah. And get, there's some a few objectionable sections in there now uh-huh. looking, looking back on it, but but it's it's for the most part still very sound. Uh, uh, Can, so, did I ever tell you how I interviewed Michael on yeah, our first date? Yeah, tell me. Yeah. So at the time I had worked about 12 years in the field of sexual abuse either with victims or offenders, Yeah. and I wanted to weed out a sex offender that I, in case, so I didn't want to date any sex offenders. Yeah. You could <laughs> put just... that in an ad in one of the dating apps. <laughs> yeah. Predators, no predators, or if you like predators, just say predators welcome. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to weed out uh, unhealthy people. Yeah. So Michael asked me out on a date. We hadn't gone on a date yet. And I said, wait, I want to ask you some questions first. And he's a very calm person. So he said, okay. And I said, well, first I want to know, how well did you, well, first, you can't ask yes or no questions. You have to ask open-ended questions because yes or no questions, as you know, end the conversation. So I said, well, tell me how your parents got along when, when you were growing up because I wanted to find out if there was any domestic violence in his history. <laughs> <laughs> and so he said, oh, they got along very well. He answered the question, yeah, they got along very well. Okay, I said, well. It was up to the point where his father killed his mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, his father punched a hole in the wall, but he didn't tell me that yet. <laughs> And then I said, well, tell me how they disciplined you when you were growing up. Because I wanted to find out if he had been physically abused as a child. <laughs> it was maybe you know, when he was locked in the closet for a week. Yeah. He <laughs> we left that out too. No, terrible. But, but he answered these questions. Yeah. Because you have to, it's not just the answers to the question, but is he, was he willing to engage in this oh, discussion yeah, with right, me? Oh, sure. Because I've told this to a friend who said, I would never have answered that question. And I said, okay, then we wouldn't have dated. Yeah. And so my third question was, um, how many times have you drunk until you passed out? Because I wanted to find out if they had a substance abuse issue. Yeah. And he, he said, I don't think I've ever drunk until I've passed out. And you said, well, now you've got something to look forward to. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but none of these questions, if he had said yes, would have been an immediate well, you know, rejection. We would have just talked about it further to okay. see what, like, what has he done to heal himself or what is he, blah, blah, blah. But my fourth question, and you're going to say this is crazy, was I, so my fourth question, I asked him, have you ever forced someone to do something sexually that she didn't want to do, either by talking her into it or by coercing her? Yeah. And he said, no. And I said, okay, then we can go on yeah. our date. But wait, wait. So then you'll say, oh, that's crazy. Who would say yes to that? But so once I was in my relationship with Mike, I started teaching all my friends yeah. how to ask these four questions. And they said, well, who would answer yes to that last question about sexual coercion? And then one day I was wanting to introduce one of my friends to someone who was rather prominent, actually. <clears throat> and I asked him the four questions, and when we got to the fourth question, he said yes. And I, in my own little codependent way, I, I had to rescue him. And I said, well, you probably don't understand what I'm saying. And I asked him again, have you f- slowly... Have you forced someone to do something sexually that she didn't want to do by talking them into it or by, by coercion? And he said, oh, I did that. And then again, I said to him, well, maybe you mean that happened probably when you were in college, you know, like were you in a fraternity? And I was making up all sorts of excuses. And he excuses. said, no, it was yesterday, but I've, I've grown up since then. <laughs> well, you're right. He said it was a couple weeks ago. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I, 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 I was dumbfounded and said, well, what are you talking about? And he said, yeah, I was at a party and there was a woman and she got so drunk she passed out. And I, I brought her up into a bedroom and I had sex with her. And I thought, oh, my God, that's a criminal violation. That's the definition right. of rape. And I was like, oh, okay, great, thanks. And he said, well, will you give me your friend's phone number? And I went, oh, 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 I don't have it, I don't have it, and, and I, I, so people do, so and anyway, I never did that because I figured he wasn't worthy, and so those are the four questions I asked, and they give you good information, so once you hook someone in, you really want to weed out and troubled there, people. And there's another dimension to what you did <laughs> that I think is really cool, is you were being a powerful woman, mm. and you were saying, you're going to have to chase me, you're going to have to prove yourself to me, I'm yeah. not going to chase you. So it's, again, that people only want what they can't get. Yes. And that, that, that's the really awesome thing about that, that beautiful, beautiful strategy. We've had uh, two or three previous podcasts, two on flirting techniques, uh, both from a male point of view, uh, Kyle is a bit of a hustler and a Kyle? good and successful. Yeah, oh yeah. 
Yeah, he became a super player. <laughs> After you taught him? Well, well he might have yes, come I with did. a little skill. I did, and, and he encouraged, uh, you know, he encouraged me to encourage him, and uh -huh. and he he and he, I, he has natural talent, let's say. <laughs> yeah, let's just say. Uh, but. Um, uh, and we also had Angela, so we did one with him, you know, male's perspective on, on dating and hustling, and then also Angela. Yeah, Angela did a, didn't she do a podcast on flirting practice? Yeah, a couple. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you go to my website, feelinggood.com, or you can, you can read Intimate Connections, you can go to my website, uh, go to uh, feelinggood.com, Feeling Good Podcast, a list of podcasts. There's a search function, you can type in flirting dating, you'll get all, all the podcasts, and there's a lot there. And I can say that hardly a workshop happens when someone doesn't come up and say, Dr. Burns, God bless you, I'm married because of your book, Intimate Connections. Oh, I was a total awesome. loser socially until I read that book, and then it just, my social life just was, was transformed. That, that makes me so happy to hear. Okay, let's do another one. That was pretty exciting. Um, Eli asks, Dr. Burns, your work has helped me tremendously over the past two years. However, recently I've discovered something about myself that I don't know how to change. I'm really curious to hear your thoughts. For some reason, when it comes to sex, it seems that I have a lot of self-worth wrapped up in my sex drive. I'm realizing when my wife and I have sex, I feel like I'm on top of the world afterwards. I feel so positive the following few days, and I feel mentally and emotionally healthy. But it's devastatingly real that the reverse is true as well. When we don't have sex, and particularly when I reach out and she is not in the mood, and when a week or two passes that we don't have sex, I find myself feeling very insecure. I feel ugly, unlovable, and generally less valuable as a person. Is there an exercise you would recommend for me to discover possible hidden thoughts or emotions that could be causing this? Is it possible to change this about myself? I want to have a close, intimate relationship with my wife, sexually and non-sexually, but I also want to feel valuable and positive whether or not we're sexually active. P.S. If by chance you use this on the podcast, could you please refer to me as Eli or something else anonymous as you usually do? Thank you for all you have, for all you do. Well, that was a really neat uh, question uh, that you asked. Eli, we'll call you Eli. And uh, really, really appreciate it. And I, I have some thoughts, and I'm sure you'll have a, a lot of thoughts too. There, there's, there's two issues involved here. One is, is that when you get very self-critical, when, when, when your wife doesn't want to have sex, uh, that, that you could be using the daily mood log and, and write down your negative thoughts, like, like uh, this means I'm ugly, uh, th this means I'm 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 not valuable. Uh, 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 this means I'm unlovable. This means I'm less valuable as a person. <clears throat> and 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 write those thoughts down. Identify the distortions in them, like uh, mind reading and self blame and emotional reasoning and should statements and all or nothing thinking and the whole host of them. And then uh, ask yourself, would I say this to a dear friend who, whose wife? didn't want to have sex with him for for a period of of time what i say oh my goodness you're you're ugly this is because you're ugly uh, this means you're unlovable this means you're less less valuable as as a person and I, I suspect you wouldn't say those things to a friend because they're they're not true they're they're just real mean spirited and see how how would you talk to a friend what would you say uh, it, only your thoughts can affect your moods and and it's your inner dialogue that, that's that's causing you to be so upset. Another aspect to, to it is 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 that uh, your 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 wife might have a tendency to feel like a bit of an object because you're 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 saying if she doesn't want to have sex sex with you then there's something wrong with you. It's as if she doesn't count that she doesn't have any feelings, and there can be many reasons that that a person doesn't doesn't want to have sex. There could be a conflict between the two of you. Maybe she's angry with you. Maybe she has a, an infection. Maybe she, she she has physical pain. During maybe she's had a really course. hard day at work, or yeah, she's yeah. working with. She spent so much time with the kid. She just right. really is tired, and she needs you to help around the house some more. Right, but but among other things, your pressure to have sex may be the actual thing that's that that's turning her off. Um, a fellow came to one of my uh, 
workshops, a two-day workshops on the five secrets of effective communication. See, this is the other thing. You need to read Feeling Good Together as well as feeling good. See, feeling good you read to change your inner dialogue. Feeling good together you, you read to change your outer dialogue, what you actually say to your wife, and to, to learn to listen, to use the disarming technique, thought and feeling empathy, inquiry, to, to, to see what's going on fr from, from her point of view. Because many people are programmed, that, 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 and it's healthy actually, that if they're feeling at conflict with somebody, you, you don't feel se sexually aroused. So. This, this, this fellow came to my, my two-day workshop on relationship problems and learned how to use the five secrets the first day and even got up on stage and we did a role play on a conflict with his wife and he saw all the errors he was making in the way he related to her and, and how to relate more skillfully to, to let her express her anger and to express warmth and love for her and to share his own feelings and to be vulnerable and open. And so uh, that night we, uh, I, I told him, you know, to go home and, and talk to her, her like this. That the problem isn't to pressure her for sex, but to, to treat her with warmth, with, with openness, and to, to try the magic of real intimacy, which is c connecting with, with, with someone, hearing their negative feelings, and providing warmth and support and, and sharing your own. It's easy to say that. It takes a lot of practice to, to learn how to do that. But at any rate, he came back to the workshop the next day with his report. He grabbed the microphone in the morning and, and, and he said, I went and I used the five, I probably mentioned this on a previous <laughs> podcast, I'm so elderly, but oh well, who cares? But it's an exciting story. But, but I, and, 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 he, and he said he used it, it just worked like a charm. And he said, we ended up making love all night long. And then in the morning, she says, you should go to a David Burns workshop more often. So if all else, else fails, Eli, come to a David Burns workshop and learn the five sacreds. But, but in the meanwhile... But I think also what you're saying is yeah. part of foreplay is listening and yeah. talking and yeah. making that connection. Yeah. Yeah, and, and intimacy isn't just having sex with someone and feeling good. That's a male thing. You feel you've triumphed, like you're adequate, you're competent. But, but, but a, another aspect of intimacy is to be able to be close to someone, including someone who, who's mad at you and who, who's upset with you and to hear and to provide support and to find closeness. I often define intimacy as the capacity of two people to share negative feelings with each other in a, in a spirit of, of respect. Uh, and, uh, and Yeah, anyway, that's great. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I thought we were going to get a little saucy there. Um, okay, Susan asks, You seem like a good person to ask this question, Dr. Burns, partly because you're a man. Someone I know, I won't say whom, told me he felt emasculated when I asked him to take my car to the gas station to get the wipers replaced. He said that he should have been able to replace them himself, but he doesn't actually know how, so he would prefer if I took the car to the service station. I said, That was stupid. Granted, that wasn't very diplomatic, and he said that's what he gets for expressing his feelings, which I frequently complain he doesn't do. To me, emasculated is more of a concept or a thought. I will not get into toxic masculinity and the patriarchy, but I am curious what you think. By the way, this person and I have benefited a lot from your relationship journal exercise. Thankfully, we did not need it this time. Well, Susan, you sound pretty enlightened to me that you're doing a lot of work, both both you and your partner, and I'm, I'm real proud of you. Uh, th this one seems to me kind of like a, a, a no-brainer. I'm very direct myself. We were talking about this before we started recording t today, and, and, and sometimes I say things that, that hurt people's feelings, and... Uh, and, and and then it's upsetting to me and it's upsetting to the other person. In our Tuesday group, we give direct feedback during exercises. And because I'm the leader of the group, if I'm not super kindly and careful in the way I give negative feedback, it can be, it can be very, very But hurtful. you also have to be careful that you're not condescending. That, that, that's right. That's right. And sometimes too. feedback um, specific and direct feedback can be really motivating. Well, that's right, and it shows respect for the other person too. Um, but but when you, you you said that his 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 feelings were stupid, it it, uh, it you know, and he was trying to express his feelings that he was feeling insecure and, and wanted a little help and, and support. And then when when you put him down, it says he's stupid. Well, in the first place, he isn't stupid, and in the second place, it just it just kind of kind of mean to to say that. 
uh, that you, you you kind of hurt him, and and then that's right. He'll 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 be more reluctant to to share his feelings. Uh, and fortunately, you can take your emotional mud and turn it into gold. And you can, I mean, if you want to, and just just say, I've been thinking about how I said you were stupid and how I hurt your feelings, and then to you the truth. Well, of course, it has to come from the heart. It has to be true, but you can say, truth, tell the truth, I'm feeling kind of ashamed and sad, and I feel like I pushed you away when I'm, I'm trying to draw you closer to me, and tell me what that's like, and tell me if I do that to you a lot, and, uh, you know, it's it's hard for me to... To open this up because it's it's, it's 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 hard to look at myself and to see how I can be kind of mean spirited sometime. And if you tell me tell me what that's what that's like, it, you know, it would, it would mean a lot to me. How, how's that? Oh my God, I'm melting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think that would open up a great conversation. Yeah, because I have to do that all the time my, my, myself, and because I make mistakes in workshops and teaching with. With patients, I'm working with, with with my family, with with, with colleagues, and uh, but I love your question because you're so open about your own errors, and we can't hope for perfection. All we can hope for is having the courage to look at our, our own errors and to talk about them and admit Repair them, and, them. And, and and use them as a way of getting close and to someone. And that's exactly what you're doing, Susan. So I give you an A plus and say continue down uh, down this this road. Use this. This failure to develop a more loving relationship. Yeah, and let us know how it goes. So here's the last one. Um, Kanaidu asks, Here is a specific example which occurred whilst I was trying to use the disarming technique. It is one where I failed to use the technique. Anyway, I was meeting a friend of mine and I was running a few minutes late for our lunch. I couldn't send her a text to let her know I was as, as I was driving, so I arrived at least five minutes late. When I, relied, when I arrived, she immediately said, I knew it all along. You really didn't want to meet with me or actually have lunch with me. I, I tried to explain that I was stuck in a traffic jam and I couldn't text. I, re, I don't know. If yeah, I'm that should have been right. a paragraph that's, that's change. Paragraph? Okay. Yeah. I replied by saying, please, Ms. Please, my friend. I was stuck in a traffic jam and that's why I am late. Have I ever said I don't want to meet with you? And if I didn't, why have I bothered to arrive at all? I mean, I could have just not arrived if I didn't want to meet with you. And after I said that, she stormed off. I'm afraid I could agree with her idea that I didn't really want to meet with her, but because the truth was, I did want to meet, but I couldn't help being late. I could agree with something that was not real to me, and if I did try to agree, I would be lying to her. Please help, David and Rhonda. <laughs> No, it says David and Fabrice. This is from it. several months ago <laughs> know, before you it. jumped on board. Too but, bad. Fabrice so, hasn't helping. Fa but I Fabrice think isn't is... here to help, but Rhonda is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I, this is what you and I were talking about, actually doing an entire podcast on this, and that's the music behind the disarm. Yes, yeah. Um, and of course you can't agree with her. She says, you didn't want to meet with me. He can't say, oh yeah, you're right, I don't want to meet with you, because exactly. that wasn't the truth. Yeah, exactly. So how would you disarm that? Well, it, it'd be really easy to do, but, but once, once again, just the obvious point is when you de defend yourself from a criticism, you prove that the criticism is valid. And, and this is human nature. We get defensive when people attack to say, oh, that's not true, Mrs. Smith. I did want to meet with you. I got stru stuck in a traffic jam. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and if I didn't want to, to meet with you, I wouldn't have arrived at all. Uh, type of thing. So he's trying to put her down. Right, he's defending himself and then that way it puts her down. Yeah, uh -huh, right, because he, he's <clears> saying, <throat> you're wrong. Yeah. Which, which, and that's her complaint, is you don't care about me. Yeah. Uh, and then he goes ahead and puts her down. That's Which the law. proves that he doesn't care about her. Exactly, exactly. So you have to hear the music, and, and, and when, when, when she says something like, I knew it all along, you really d don't want to meet with me or actually have, have lunch with me, well, I'll take a stab at it, and you can take a stab at it. But I, I, I would say it's, so, it's painful to hear, hear you say that because I really like you a lot, and I was excited to meet with you, but, but I, I don't think I've conveyed the, the warmth and, and caring that I have my enthusiasm for for you and for connecting with you and it it was just dis disrespectful to, to 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 be to be late uh, i got caught in a traffic jam but that's just an excuse because i could have left earlier 
just just to have an extra cushion. And I wouldn't be surprised if you're feeling hurt and angry and uh, ticked off at me. And uh, I just want you to know that I'm in, in pain too, uh, because it's it, it hurts to see that I've I've hurt you or upset you or been thoughtless or or not not respectful or not 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 caring. Can you tell me more about about how how you are feeling? I, I really want to hear what it's been like for you, and maybe other things I've done or said that that kind of hurt hurt your feelings or, or turned you off. How's that? That's really good. Is it? Yeah. That, mm, mm, I, mm -hmm. And why why is that good? Um. Well, you took a hundred percent responsibility. You acknowledged her feelings. You invited her to tell you not only how this felt, but other times. And yeah. um, you didn't defend yourself. You were just extremely open, and you conveyed a lot of love toward her. Yeah. And again, that's the other law of opposites. The other paradox is when you agree with a false criticism, you prove that the criticism is false. The other person will stop, stop believing it. And this is so hard for people to learn. This is the hardest of the five secrets of effective communication, but by far the most important, the disarming technique. And, and perhaps we will have another podcast on that at, at, at some point, because yeah. it's important in therapy, it's important in, in personal relationships. And the, the unwillingness or inability to do this is why the world right now is kind of falling apart, because everyone's arguing with the other person saying, you're wrong, you're bad, we're good, we're right. Mm -hmm. And and that leads to more antagonism and, as we've escalation. said, to, to escalation and even violence, as we're mm -hmm. starting to see now with all the, the, the shootings that are, that are going on, the mass, the mass killings. Uh, it's, it, it, it's pretty alarming, the hatred, uh, the wave of hatred that's sweeping around the world right, right now. Maybe I should make political comments. No, you should. What, what What do you think of this disarm? I'm going to take a stab at it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know all along you didn't really want to meet with me, and uh, or actually have lunch with me. Well, you know, you're right. I was really thinking of myself. I was really involved in my project, and I didn't pay attention to the time or how long it would take for me to get to see you. And I put my needs first, and I easily could have stopped what I was doing earlier to um, imagine, you know, to pay attention to the traffic and, and, and plan it out better and put our date, you know, more ahead of, more of a priority of what I was doing. And I can really imagine how you're feeling rejected and sad and even angry or irritated at me. And I am feeling really ashamed. I'm feeling sad that I've lost the opportunity to spend this time with you because I really, you really matter a lot to me. And I have been looking forward to this lunch and getting to know you better and deepening our relationship. And I'm wondering if you can tell me, you know, more about what it was like that while you were sitting here waiting for me, what you were thinking and what you were feeling and, um, you know, what it was, you know, tell me more about what that experience was like. And even any other times I've disappointed you or made you angry. I really want to hear about it. Yeah, that, 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 that sounds excellent to me too. I, oh, I don't okay. see any way to improve on that. Oh, goody. So. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I think that's the end of our episode today. That that was that's oh, okay. all of and then your just, questions. Go wait, and then just a quick commercial message. Commercial if you're break. Still hanging in there is that I've got some upcoming workshops. In fact, on this very topic, uh, I've got the. In, I don't know when this is going to be broadcast, but in early October, I think October third, I've got a killer one day workshop with Jill Levitt, who's probably the top person in the world on the five secrets of effective communication. Yep. She's just a relationship genius is the only way to put it. And she's, and she and I love to co-present and we'll do a one day workshop on using the five secrets of effective communication. It'll be kind of focused on therapeutic uh, interactions, but it will also be applicable to your, your relationship with your family, your kids, your partner, your, your friends, your, your, and, and your colleagues. And so it's a one-day program. You can join from anywhere in the world because you can join on, online. And we'll have a lot of helpers uh, mentoring you and coaching you in the uh, small group exercises on, online. And then in November, I'm doing a, a, a four-day intensive in Atlanta, Georgia. So uh, you can check that out uh, as well on my website, feelinggood.com on the workshop tab, and you can read about these upcoming workshops, and, and you, there's also links for further information and uh, registration. 
So thank you for listening, and remember to send us your, your questions, your, your comments, your, your feedback, because uh, the, it's the dialogue with you, the interaction with all of you that gives us, I would say, energy and, and excitement about when, when, we, uh, when, 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 when we talk to you like this. That was great. Okay, thank you so much, and see you next time. This has been another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast. For more information, visit Dr. Burns' website at feelinggood.com, where you will find the show notes for this episode under the podcast page. You will also find archives of previous episodes and many resources for therapists and non-therapists. We welcome your comments and questions. If you want to support the show, please share the podcast with people who might benefit from it. You could also go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. The theme music is Gypsy Jazz in Paris, 1935, composed and performed by Brett Van Donsel. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski. We hope you enjoyed this episode. I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast.